Hello, everyone. It's so good to be here with you today. Um, thank you for joining. If you're joining online, um, we're going to sing together and worship joyfully. Um, would you please stand to your feet and let's join our voices together. Bridge Church. I'm glad you're here. And the bridge, we, our mission is to help people connect with God 
and develop them into fully devoted followers of Jesus. So I'm glad you're here, whether in person or online. And to let us know that you're in person or online, you can fill out your communication card. And there's three ways to do that. You can do it with the, the Bridge app. You can take your smartphone and you can actually take a picture of the QR code on the front of your program. Or you can go to thebridgechurchec.org. Under Sundays, you'll find a communication card there. And on the communication card, there's a, a place for prayer requests. And so we'd love for you to fill it out. That's just a way for us to know how we can care for you and be praying for you during this time. All announcements are in this program. It's on the sheet here or on the Thursday email that went out. And next Sunday, guys, take note that we're forgetful, but it's Mother's Day. Mother's Day next Sunday, and we're going to celebrate here at, at the bridge by doing a child dedication. So if that's something that you wanted to do, but you haven't talked to Pastor Jerry yet, make sure you do that as soon as possible so we can plan in uh, accordingly. And uh, that is what you need to know. And before we pray for our service, I want to invite Willie Wendler up. He's going to give us an exciting ministry update. Thanks, Lee. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Willie Wendler, and my family and I have been coming to the bridge for about 10 years, and one of the things that I really enjoy about the bridge church is our willingness to serve each other, and we have seen that happen uh, many times over the years. But what we, are willing to, or what we are going to do is kicking off a new ministry called the Bridge Laborers. And what we will be doing is compiling a list of volunteers that are willing to help with things such as moving, gardening, uh, painting, or other small household tasks that could rise up, to name a few. And here's how you can help. You can send an email to info at the Bridge Church ec.org with your name and phone number, and then you will be added to my list of volunteers. Uh, men and women are encouraged to sign up for this, and you will be notified when a need comes up, and then you are able to choose which opportunities that you are able to uh, work. I also know of two needs already this month that are coming up, and also if you have helped in the past, and I've reached out to you, uh, please sign up again so that we have an updated list. The other side of this ministry is that if you have a need that the church can help with, uh, you can send an email with your need and when you need that done to info at thebridgechurchec.org as well. And then I would do my best to arrange the volunteers for that. The other thing is as we get this new ministry up and running, uh, I have a vision to be able to expand this to become an outreach ministry. This is something that we could do in the community uh, for people outside of the Bridge Church, and also we could include volunteers that aren't members as well. And uh, what a great opportunity that would be to be the hands and feet of Jesus. So send an email uh, if you are willing to volunteer or if you have a need and we will be in touch with you. And then if you have any questions, feel free to uh, touch bases with me after the service. Thank you. Thank you, Willie. It sounds like a great option for us as a church to demonstrate Christ's love, not only to us, but also to our community and people who don't yet know Jesus. And so really excited that you're taking lead on that. Grateful for our church leadership. And uh, so let me do that. Let me pray for our service, and we'll continue on. God, we pray that your spirit would fill us. God, I pray that we would, even as we worship, confess sin, any unknown unbelief that we have that might hinder us from really walking with you. And so, Spirit, I pray that you convict us of sin, any unbelief that we have. And God, I pray that we can experience forgiveness, knowing that uh, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, God, I, I continue, uh, I pray that you prepare our hearts uh, today as we hear from Pastor Jerry, I pray that his words would be your words, God, and I pray that these songs would kind of usher us into your presence, and uh, yeah, Lord, I pray that you help us to know you better and become more fully devoted followers of you. And so we thank you, I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Um, we invite you to stand again as we continue in song. Um, it's such a unique opportunity to get together and worship um, it seems, especially since COVID, it's, you know, like Pastor Jerry says, he'll never take it for granted again, meeting together. Um, Psalm 34 
says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Let's do that this morning.
turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished.
Jesus, thank you that we have hope in you that is alive, and thank you for your Holy Spirit who is with us, and we just praise you this morning and um, ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive what you would have us learn from your word, and that you would encourage us this morning um, by being with one another and um, sharing in communion later. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. You can take a seat. Thank you so much, worship team. It is great to be with you in person. Uh, I'm just so glad, and again, I'm not going to take this uh, for granted. Two things before we let um, Bridge Kids go. Uh, we are going to be celebrating communion, and if you can't see it, we have communion up at the front. And um, after the message, um, I'll be inviting you for that opportunity. Once again, it'll be a sealed communion. So um, it'll have the wafer on top, and you peel off the top, and then the juice will be under that. So we'll be doing that. I know you probably aren't sure you can see what's up here. I don't know. I know if I were sitting in the back, I wouldn't be able to see it, but maybe it's all perfectly clear to you. And then uh, if you notice in the ads on May 30th, we're going to do a joint worship service with Valley Brook Church, and we're going to be at Owen Park at the Band Chill. So uh, I'm hoping we're going to have a beautiful day, and you know you can bring your own uh, picnic lunch to hang out afterwards. It's not going to be like a formal anything like that, but it'll be bring your own if you want to hang out after the the service and maybe get a chance to know some new people. Okay, Bridge Kids, thank you so much for joining us. You're dismissed. You can head out to your uh, classrooms. It's so discouraging to have people leave when you get up to speak. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2, we're going to be in verses 1 through 11. This is uh, one of the best known passages in the New Testament. It is loaded with theology. Um, I have loved it uh, since I first learned about it. In 2001, law enforcement officers discovered three animals that needed to be rescued during a drug arrest. The drug dealer had a lion and a tiger and a bear. I know you want to say, oh my. And they were all held in cages, and the cages were too small for each one. The animals had been abused and neglected, and each of them uh, had an infestation of parasites. The bear had a leather harness ingrown into his skin because the harness had never been removed or loosened as the bear grew. The harness had to be surgically removed after the rescue. All three animals were taken to Noah's Ark Animal Sanctuary in Georgia. When they were placed in the sanctuary, uh, the staff uh, evaluated the situation, and they saw these three large predators that are naturally enemies, and so they separated them. But that didn't work very well, because all three of them were very uncooperative in this situation. The lion was named Leo. The American black bear was named Baloo. And the Bengal tiger was named Shinnecon. When the three became separated, the staff had to do something. And so they brought the animals together again. And immediately the animals calmed down and were very cooperative. For the next 15 years, the, free, the three friends spent their days together uh, playing ball and cuddling and chasing each other and eating cookies together. And if you don't believe me, it's all on video. Um, one staff member at Noah's Ark said, they live together and they don't see their differences. They don't know they're not supposed to be friends. They can't tell that they're not the same color or the same shape or the same size. 
What can we learn from them? God has designed his church with different people, different shapes and different sizes, different colors, different backgrounds, different experiences, social differences, cultural difference, ethnical differences, political difference, yet in Christ we are to be one family, one body, one church. And it's not about our differences. It's about what we have that's alike, what we have in common. Last week we saw Paul's focus in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. I want to go back and read that. This is Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. And Paul writes, whatever happens, remember he was in prison, he was facing possibly a life or death situation. He says, to, for, for to me to live is um, Christ and to die is gain. And then he comes to verse 27, he says, whatever happens, life or death, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. That was Paul's heart, desire, that the church strive together for the sake of the gospel of Christ. So um, we come uh, to our passage today, and in verses 1 through 4, we see that we should live with an attitude that puts others first. Live with an attitude that puts others first. Now, you know there's an outline in your program. Just to remind you, there's a pretty detailed outline on, online if you would like to see that. It actually has every scripture that I use printed out. And, uh, you know, you can see that. Don't be looking for the videos on the lion, the tiger, and the bear. <laughs> Verses 1 and 2. Just don't turn on your speaker. Then you're going to get in real trouble. <laughs> Focus on the higher goal we see in verses 1 and 2. Why? First of all, it's reasonable. Paul says, this is logical, folks. Pay attention, he says. Therefore, verse 1, if you, if you have any encouragement from being united with the Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion. Now, you probably just noticed that Paul used if a lot, four times, and those are conditional statements. When we read it, it sounds to us like, well, maybe this is true and maybe it's not. If this is true, then this, but what if it's not true? Well, I don't know. Well, Paul is using a structure here, grammar in the, in the original language that shows that this is a first-class condition. There are three options for the Greeks when it comes to if. For us, we don't think that way. But the if is a, is a certainty from Paul's perspective. This is true, folks. You can count on this. You can take it to the bank. And he's saying, therefore, since you have an encouragement from being united with Christ, he reminds them of their conversion to Christ. He reminds them about their relationship with Jesus and how encouraging that has been. They have experienced that firsthand. Paul can name the Philippians by name. If you go back to Acts 16, you can see some of them come to faith in Christ. There was Lydia. There was a Philippian jailer. There, there was his family. And I can't remember the other guy's name. <laughs> but, but he knows them, and, and he knows a lot of them, and, and he knows their experience. And I bet you've experienced encouragement that comes from Christ and be united with Christ. See, when we place our faith in Christ... We get connected to God. That's why we want to help people connect with God. Uh, the Holy Spirit takes us out of the world. We are baptized into the, the, uh, the body of Christ. We become a real member of the body of Christ. And I'm talking about an, a spiritual identity in Christ. And, and in that relationship, there's a whole lot of benefits. And that's what Paul is focusing on here. Next, he says, if there's any comfort from uh, his love. Well, of course there is. Absolutely there is. Have you found refreshment in experiencing Christ's love, knowing that he loved you, that he died for you, that he gave himself for you, that he took your death and he paid your uh, penalty, 
that you've been rescued from hell because of Christ's love, uh, that God was working. Um, so have you experienced that comfort from the love of Christ? Have you experienced that love that comes through the body of Christ? Because that's how God works. God loves people through people. And when we're walking with Christ, we become a conduit. God's love flows through us and out to other people. If we're not walking with Christ, we short-circuit the whole thing, and nobody's going to get God's love from us. But that's what, have you experienced comfort that comes from, have you experienced comfort that comes uh, from another Christ follower who shares something with you, shares truth, maybe something from God's word, and it speaks to you, and you know God is looking out for you. God is caring for you. Next, he says, if there's any common sharing in the Spirit. This is about real community through the Holy Spirit. And um, it happens through the lives of of one to another as God love works through us, as we care, as we pray for each other. Uh, we have this community, this, this unity that comes from the sharing. of we, Another translation is fellowship, but we kind of get lost with that word. It just sounds like it doesn't apply to us or something or that it's old-fashioned. And then if any tenderness and compassion, have you experienced God's tenderness and his compassion through other believers caring for you. All of these things are true. The Philippians had experienced each one firsthand, and Paul knows it. And so for us, we need to focus on this higher goal because it's reasonable, but also it, it brings unity in verse 2. If you have experienced these benefits that come from knowing Christ, Paul says in verse 2, then make my joy complete. And, you know, Paul's kind of saying, you know, you bring me a lot of joy. I love to see how God is at work in your life. But you know what? It's not complete yet. There's still some things that would re even bring me more joy to make my joy complete. Well, how do you do that? Well, by being like-minded, Paul says, by being on the same page with gospel values, by having the same priorities to reach people for Christ by pursuing conduct worthy of the gospel of Christ. So Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 is an extension of chapter 1 verse 27. It's all a part of the same section. And, and Paul is explaining how, how to have this worthy conduct. So he, he's saying, uh, being like-minded. And ultimately, it's going to be having the mind of Christ. And then he says, and have the same love. The great thing is, God's love doesn't run out. We get tired caring for people. We, we can get tired of serving people. But when God is empowering us, He's not going to be wearing out. That doesn't mean you don't have to rest. I'm just saying... We tend to wear out because we're operating without Christ's strength and with, without his love working through us. It's a sacrificial love. It's a concern for the well-being of the one loved. It's the same kind of love that God has for us. And then he says, being one in spirit and of one mind. And this is about having the unity, not uniformity, because we are different. We're not going to be alike. We're not required to think the same things about everything. You don't have to have the same political views. You don't have to have the same views about masks. You don't have to have the same views about the color of my hair or anything. It's just about having the same mind and same priorities as Jesus. Jesus prayed earnestly for this unity um, he wanted his church to have this unity. And we see that in John 17. And let's have a look at that. John 17, verses 20 through 23. And uh, Jesus, this is recorded uh, the, the night before Jesus was uh, crucified. 
and he says, my prayer is not for them alone. And he's referring back to his own disciples. He's referring back to the 12. He has just prayed for them earlier in John 17. Now he's, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Well, that includes you and me because we have believed in Jesus through all of these followers down through the ages. He's praying for the followers of Christ throughout history that all of them may be one. He's talking about a sense of unity, a coming together, a striving as one man uh, to fulfill the Great Commission. And then he says, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, just because we have that relationship and this closeness and this intimacy and we're on the same page together, that's what I want for Christ followers. Next slide. He says, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now, this, this is a powerful thing. Jesus is telling us that when we have this unity that's based on uh, having the mind of Christ and the same priority system and walking in the power of the Spirit, he's saying, this lets the world know. It sends a message out. It's an evangelistic strategy. God sent his Son. That Jesus is the real deal. But differences, when we focus on our differences and things that we don't like about the way other people do things, uh, whatever it is, when we focus on those differences, we are not sending a message that draws people and confirms that Christ is the real deal. He says, I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me so that they, they may be brought to complete unity. That's what Jesus wants for us. He wants unity in us, a complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and I have loved them even as you have loved me. The world is going to know about God's love. That we have been loved and that we can love other people with that love. So focus on the higher goal because it brings unity. And then verses 3 and 4, make an attitude adjustment. We're, we're going to have to do that. And, you know, we're going we're gonna to make an attitude of adjustment before we come before God this morning and share in a time of communion. Make an attitude adjustment. Or try to get over yourself. Life is not all about you. Yes, there's a place for you in this life. And God loves you, and He cares for you, and He provides for you, and he's, He wants to answer your prayer. But it's not all about you and me. And so, uh, in verse 3, remove yourself from the center of the universe, because that's God's place. And Paul writes, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Life is not about you and me. Um... And Paul's saying, don't let selfish ambition, selfish ambition be your motivation. It's not about me first. Vain conceit, this is a cool picture here. Vain conceit is the picture of a head that is, is expanding and empty. That's what vain conceit is. It's uh, hot air, and it's getting puffed up. It's have a higher view of yourself than reality. Now, you ought to have a high view of how God made you and who God made you to be and what it means to be a child of God and what it means to be forgiven and a citizen of heaven, having been made in the image of God. That is an awesome view, and that is an accurate view if you were a follower of Christ. But you, are, you don't belong up here where God is. Um, so do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. And we, so we're going to make an attitude of adjustment. Verse 3, humble yourself before God. Humble yourself. Rather, Paul writes, in humility, value others above yourselves. Humility is a choice. Humility is a virtue that primarily originated with Jesus. I don't know if a lot of people know that. He was the one who brought it out to the forefront Humility was an anti-value in the first century. It was like the opposite of a virtue. It was like a big weakness. If you're humble, 
you're just weak, you're wimpy. But Jesus um, made it a supreme value. He gave it spiritual strength and spiritual authority. It's about choosing to value others above yourself. It's not about having a low self-esteem. Sometimes people get confused about humility and having a low self-image. That's not it. Because you need to know your identity in Christ. That's a good thing. And it's a positive thing. And it's a high view of humanity as a follower of Christ. So humble yourself before God. And then look for the needs of others in verse 4. Look for the needs of others. He writes, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. So it's about thinking about other people first before us. It's about thinking of their needs. Um, there's a great example that happened. Uh, it's, it's another video clip. You can catch it after. In 2012, Officer um, Lawrence DePrimo was doing a beat in Times Square, New York City, and it was a very cold November night, and he came across a homeless man sitting without any shoes on. And there were people laughing at, at, the, at the man, and, and that's what got the officer's attention. What are they laughing about? And they, he could see that the man didn't have shoes, and, and he could see the blisters on his feet from over 15 feet away. And the officer said, it was a cold night. I had on two pairs of socks, and my feet were cold. And here sits this guy with no socks and no shoes. And so um, eventually the man began to walk away. The homeless man walked away, and the officer followed him. And he said, what size of shoes do you wear? And he went off uh, to the, the nearby uh, shoe store, it was a Skechers shoe store, and he spent $100 and bought a, a nice pair of size 12 and some very warm socks. Not only that, he went up to the man, and he put the socks on him and helped him put his shoes on. Now, normally, that never would catch any attention. But somebody videotaped this. So there, was a, there was a tourist from Arizona and caught this on tape. And of course, it made national news. But that's an example about one person putting the needs of someone else uh, first. Jesus would have liked that story, wouldn't he? Matthew 22, 39. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's what this officer was doing. Um, it's really a good example of not looking out for your own personal interests, but for the interests of others. So live with an attitude, verses 1 through 4, that puts others first. And then we come to this last section, verses 5 through 11. This is a profound section. Live with an attitude that puts Jesus above all. Um, best known section in the book of Philippians, one of the most written about in the New Testament. Verses 5 through 8, we are to follow Jesus' example, and we need to have his very same attitude in verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. This is about how we treat each other, in our relationships with each other. You know, it's one thing to have the mind of Jesus and never be around other people. Life is great, isn't it? But to have the mind of Jesus when you're with other people, and sometimes other people can stress you out, and other people have do things differently or have different opinions, they disagree with you, how do you handle that? And um, we're to have the same attitude. This attitude and this approach that God wants his people to follow, having the mind of Christ, seeking his kingdom first, his priorities, his values first, the mind of Christ. Verses 6 and 7 have the same humility 
who being in the very nature God. This is a description of Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God. And here is a description, the very nature. The word translated nature is kind of an important one in this section. It's sometimes translated form, depending on your translation. And I don't think that's a very clear word. I think nature is a much better word. But in the original language, the word is morphe, and it refers to the inner reality or the essence of the thing. What is he saying? He's saying Jesus was God. Do you get it? It's very clear. That's what Paul wants to say. Do we know who he is? He is God. That's his very nature. That's who he is at his very core. Jesus was the Son. And continuing, he did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. He did not consider using his position that was equal with the Father for his own advantage. Now, he could have, couldn't he? He could have. He didn't use his position to escape from difficulty. He didn't use his position to escape from crucifixion or arrest. He didn't use his position to escape from his critics. Rather, verse 7, he made himself nothing. He, he humbled himself by taking the very nature of a servant. And there's that word again, same word, nature, morphe, the real essence of the thing. Jesus was really a human, a, a servant, a real human servant. He was truly God and he was truly human, fully God and fully man. And he took the very nature of humanity and he did not lose his deity in any way he just chose not to use it for his own advantage now that jesus is fully human and fully god is one of the most misunderstood concepts in the bible all across our nation there are churches meeting this morning and there is a lot of confusion on this one jesus is fully god and fully human. There's certainly a lot of awesome churches that are very clear on this one too. Let me say that. But this was an important value for Jesus. Uh, remember John 13 and 14 and 15, and he, uh, John records for us, Jesus said, now that I, your Lord, and Jesus had just washed the disciples' feet in the upper room. Remember that? And, and he, he took off his outer garment and he got down on on the floor, and he, he washed the disciples' feet, the dirty feet, one at a time. I, I don't like to touch other people's feet. Jesus did. He says, just as I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I want you to do that. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. So, now, Jesus wasn't trying to uh, create this new foot washing ministry. There's nothing wrong with the foot washing ministry. But he's talking about his, the example that he's just created, and that's to be a servant, to humbly serve each other. This is a lifestyle of a Christ follower. Not only should we have uh, the same humility, but we should have the same obedience in verse 8. And we see in verse 8, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Most of your translations will have an exclamation after death on a cross because it was such a horrific thing. That was the point of it. It was so embarrassing and so humiliating, humiliating and so awful. It was a, Jesus did this all the way to that. Roman citizens were not uh, crucified. It was only for like the worst criminals. And Jesus experienced a crucifixion. He was a found in an in in appearance as a man. And he was a man. And he looked like a man. He was a unique man. He had a human nature, but not a sin nature. 
a very unique individual. He humbled himself. And this is the greatest example of all humility. He was totally obedient in his relationship with God. He was fully devoted. And he's obedient to death. It was Jesus who gave us the Great Commission, right? It's why, it's why we're here. It's why we're a church today is because of, of these instructions in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. The way we talk about it is uh, we want to help people connect with God and develop them into fully devoted followers of Christ. We want them to have a relationship and we want them to grow. And let's just be reminded of what Jesus said. He said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. So it's about taking the gospel, the good news, and sharing it so people understand and they, they choose to come to faith in Christ and they become followers. They become disciples of Christ. And then baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so Christ followers, when, when they believe, they, they should be baptized as Christ followers. And if you read the New Testament, next week we're going to have a child dedication. If you read the New Testament, nowhere in the New Testament do we see an infant ever baptized, ever, ever. And what we see in the New Testament is a model that people come to faith in Jesus Christ first, and then they are baptized as Christ followers. And they are immersed, because that's what that word means. It means to be immersed, and their practice was immersing in water in the first century. And then, and here we have verse 20, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. Sometimes this is called the great omission because sometimes people leave that out. They focus on this great evangelistic effort, but they lose track of the responsibility to be fully obedient, to teach them to obey not the things that you like, and I think, you know, my experience as a Christ follower is when I placed my faith in Christ and began to hang out with Christians, it was sort of like the goal was to be a good Christian. And that's not what Jesus asked for. He didn't want you to be like a C-plus Christian or a B-minus Christian. He wanted you to be a fully devoted follower. He wanted you to obey everything. It's a high standard. We should pursue the same obedience that Jesus did. Lastly, we come to verses 9 through 11. We are to submit to Jesus' lordship. We see his awesome position in verse 9. He's, Paul writes, therefore God exalted him. This, now God has stepped in. The first verses are about Jesus, the Son. This is about God the Father. God steps in and he exalts Jesus to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. So we know that Jesus died on the cross and paid the penalty for our sins, and that's why we're going to celebrate communion today, and that Jesus was buried and that Jesus was raised again. And then after 40 days, he ascended into heaven and he sat down at the right hand of God in this awesome high position. It was the highest place, the highest position, and it had the highest authority. Um, Jesus, the Son, had a responsibility for humility and service and obedience. And the Father exalted the Son for this life. And the Father is going to exalt your life for your humility and your service and your obedience. We come to uh, his authority in verse 10. And after God exalted him, we come to verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. I want you to just think about this a minute. This is a point in history that you and I are going to experience no matter what. No matter what. Every person in this room will experience this point in history. And this is where history is moving. We are going to this place. And at the name of Jesus, the heavens are going to cry out, Jesus. Every knee should bow 
in heaven. There'll be believers who are already in heaven, and they're going to rejoice, and they're going to humbly worship the true and living God. The angels in heaven are going to hear this, and they're going to humbly worship the true and living God. And then those on earth, and maybe there'll be believers left. I don't know exactly when this is coming. Maybe there'll be believers on earth at that time. And the believers are going to humbly bow before Jesus. I don't know what this is going to be like. I just sort of picture that I'm not going to have to, you know, like bend my knees. I think I'm just going to melt right in front of him, you know? And it's just going to be, I'm going to be overwhelmed with the power and the love of God right there. Just overwhelmed. And then he says, on earth and under the earth. Well, some of those people will be unbelievers. Some of those people will already be condemned to hell. Some of those beings will be fallen angels. They'll be demons and Satan himself. And they will all bow before Jesus Christ and acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. That's where we're going for the next Next verse in verse 11, his power. Every tongue acknowledge that Christ Jesus is Lord. What, what is that about? Jesus is Yahweh. Jesus is God. He's the true and living God. A lot of people don't have trouble with the Father being the true and living God. Jesus is God. He is the Son. And it's going to be acknowledged in the universe one day that every tongue will acknowledge this, and it will bring glory and honor to God the Father. Question for us, how do we rise above our circumstances? And I want to look at Colossians chapter 3, verses uh, 1 and 2. We looked at this last week. Colossians chapter 3, and Paul writes in another book, uh, he says, since then you have been raised with Christ, Uh, That's a position we have, whether you know it or not. The the, the concept that when you place your faith in Christ, part of your identity is you've been given a position in heaven. You've been been raised with Christ, and you are with him in position, spiritual position. You have authority there with him, not his authority, not the same as him, but he has delegated authority to you. This is uh, read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and verses, verse 6. And since you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated. It's about putting our hearts on Him. It's about placing Him as our highest priority where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things because sometimes we forget. Sometimes we get so wrapped up in our everyday life and the problems we face and the circumstances we have and we and we just lose track of what God's role is and what God's position is and how I'm going to make it through this and how how I'm going to rely on God's strength this is a daily focus it's a it's a daily attitude adjustments it's choosing to follow Jesus humbly for us sometimes we think we need to we need to stand out and we need to be heard and we think we are entitled and we think we should have life liberty and the pursuit of happiness and by the way nowhere did Jesus ever promise that You've been promised that in America but Jesus didn't promise it to you We are called to follow Jesus in humility He called us to humble ourselves and rise above our circumstances. Humble yourselves and rise above your circumstances. Today we're going to humble ourselves before God and come together for a time of communion, a time to remember uh, what Jesus did for us, a time to focus on his death, We just need to remember, to reflect, because we have an, an ability to just to take this for granted. And it's the most important event that ever happened in history when Jesus died for you and for me. 
And so we take the cup, and the Bible is clear that we ought to examine ourselves first, that we ought not do this unless we're spiritually ready, unless we've uh, had God evaluate us. I don't have to evaluate you. It's you and God. And if he points out something you need to confess, you just need to be honest with him and confess it. God has sort of designed this to be a, a, a day, a time where the whole church has a chance to kind of come clean before him. And we can be one together as we follow Christ. And so um, I'd like to pray. I'm, I want to thank the Lord for the bread and the cup. And uh, I also want us just to take uh, some private time to evaluate our lives ourselves. And if, and if you need to confess any sin, do that privately with God. Let's, let's pray. Father, we just pause before you. May, may you guide our thinking. May you remind us of who we are and your love for us. May you remind us of the gift you've given us. We are your children, children of God. God, if we've done anything to displease you, may we just be honest with you right now. God, I just want to praise you one more time for the promise that you've given to us in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness. Thank you for forgiveness. I thank you for each person who's just been honest before you and if they've had something to confess, that they have brought that to you. Thank you that you have forgiven them. Right now, they are forgiven, not because of my words, but because of your promise. And then, God, we want to thank you for the bread that represents the body of Christ. We think back to the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. It was costly. He gave everything. He gave his all. He gave his life. His body was nailed to the cross. And you viewed it as a payment for sin. It was our redemption. And I thank you for the cup. It represents his shed blood that was poured out on our behalf. We don't deserve to have our sins forgiven. It's by your grace. Thank you that Jesus gave his life for our life. We thank you for the bread and we thank you for the cup. In Jesus' strong name, amen. So, whenever you're ready, you may come forward. There's a station here and a station here, and you can just pick up your communion. You can walk back to your chair and you can take it whenever you're ready.
Scripture says, for as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. God wants us to be on mission as we walk into the future together one day at a time, to strive together as one, conducting ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. It's until he comes. He is coming back. And there's going to be a time one day when every knee will bow, every being in the universe will humbly bow before Jesus Christ. Will it be a great joy for us? Or will some people be humiliated and embarrassed? And they're going to be people, they're going to know for eternity that Jesus was the real deal. And by the way, I want everybody possible to go with us, all right? God bless you all. Next week, we have 13 kids to dedicate, so I hope you'll come back. We're dismissed. <laughs>